Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to try this again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Mo okay, wonderful. <laughs> good morning. I'm Andrew Seeley. I'm president of the Migration Policy Institute. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here this morning to this discussion of MPI's flagship initiative, Rethinking U.S. Immigration Policy. Um, it's no secret that whatever consensus once existed on immigration policy has broken down, and that's partially a function of politics, but it's also a result of changing realities on the ground. Um, the old assumptions that drove our understandings about what could work in terms of immigration policy have actually changed along the way. Um, but sensible immigration policy remains absolutely critical for the future of the United States. It is key to our labor force growth and the attraction, retention, and development of human capital in the competitive global economy. It's central to ensuring legal channels through which people can come to this country while reducing incentives and opportunities for unauthorized entry. It's essential for our commitment to refuge and asylum for those fleeing persecution, consistent with both our international obligations and our leadership on the global stage. But none of this is possible without rethinking our assumptions about our labor market needs, assessing the nature of current immigration flows, and beginning to imagine what a sensible policy design for the future should look like. This initiative, which is being launched today, which is led by Doris Meisner, Julia Gillette, and Musafer Chisti, who are all here today. Um, you'll hear from Julia and Doris in a moment. We'll engage stakeholders, a broad group of stakeholders, to begin to think through the possibilities of the future and to put together a big picture, evidence-based blueprint of what sensible immigration policy would look like with very specific proposals for the different elements of that blueprint. Doris and Julia will tell you more about this in a moment, and we're extremely pleased also to have former Secretary Carlos Gutierrez with us here today, good friend of MPI and someone who has shown leadership not only in the Bush administration, but also as a business leader and CEO of one of the largest companies in the country and continues to give great leadership in the private sector. Um, and Cecilia Munoz, who served as director of the Domestic Policy Council in the Obama White House, also someone who's given enormous leadership to this country um, in advocacy and policy analysis and continues to do so from uh, the New America Foundation. Um, very glad to have both of you here. Thank you. And good friends of MPI both. So great to have you to, to launch this and lead this off. And I'd also like to recognize our board chair, Jim Ziegler. Very good to have you here today before you start a trip. Glad you can make room. I think Louis Friedberg is with us, one of our board members, and possibly Lisa Massimino as well. So good there. Lisa, good to see you. So good to have all of you here. And Louis, I know, changed his schedule to join us. So glad to have all of you here. Um, and it's my great privilege to turn this over. I should also thank people that have supported us. We're not going to throw out the names here because I'll miss a few people, but all the foundations that have supported this effort, you'll see this as we begin to publish. Um, let me turn this over to Doris Meisner, who is Senior Fellow at MPI, as well as Director of the U.S. Policy Program, um, and will one of the most respected voices on immigration policy. Thank you, Andrew, and good morning to all of you. Let me add my welcome, and let me add my thanks for your being here, as well as my thanks uh, to our special guests, uh, with whom I will have a conversation when Julia and I finish telling you a bit about this initiative. So I'm going to give you a, uh, a bit of an overview. Uh, it's laid out in a concept note that you received either on the way in, it was probably on your chairs, a little bit more fully, but I'll try to um, hit some high points. And uh, Julia will follow me and talk a little bit more fully about one of the issues that's a key issue that we're exploring, which has to do with uh, immigration and the economy. And then um, we're gonna test some of the propositions that we're putting on the table uh, with people that are seasoned actors uh, on these issues from both political parties. And that's the purpose of our having a conversation. So let me start by saying that um, <clears throat> we have certainly seen in the current presidency, immigration as a top tier issue for the country in a way that has really never been the case before uh, uh, in a prior presidency. And that center stage place for immigration promises to be very important and center stage through the period of our reelection going into 2020. So what we're seeing, of course, is this issue that has already been very controversial for us as a society, becoming more and more controversial, and not only from the standpoint of how uh, important it's been in this presidency, but also with a tremendous amount of pushback uh, that has come from across various sectors of our society. And what that has done together, put together, has been really very all-consuming 
probably certainly for people like us who watch these issues on a day-to-day basis, but also for the country and people in this room who are in one way or another interested in the issues. Um, But we have to also recognize that whatever it is that's going on day to day, and there is a great deal of it, it can mask the fact that uh, the immigration system has been failing us as a country for many years. And that's not only the case now, but it precedes this presidency, and it is an issue where Congress has simply been unable to act in a way that fixes it. So this rethinking initiative that we're announcing today springs from the continuing political stalemate uh, that surrounds immigration policy um, and focuses really on what we see as new realities that make the the disconnect between our nation's immigration laws and circumstances on the ground ever wider and more damaging. The initiative that we're announcing today is a rethinking that is an attempt to fill that gap, an attempt to close more fully that disconnect. We aim to produce, as Andrew said, an evidence-driven, big-picture vision of the ways that, that are ways forward um, <clears throat> that, uh, for immigration, backed up by solid proposals for a functioning, orderly system of the role immigration can and should play in the country's future. Our starting point is new realities that are facing the country that we believe should drive immigration policymaking rather than the tired debates of the last 20 years that have dealt with the problem of fixing illegal immigration um, and have been collectively known as comprehensive immigration reform. Those problems persist. They need to be addressed. But we're asking a different question. We're asking the question of what kinds of policies and system allow immigration to function as a comparative advantage for the country, as has almost always been the case in the past, and a strategic resource for the future of the country in concert, of course, with security uh, considerations and rule of law imperatives. So when we talk about new realities, what do we need? What do we mean? By new realities. Well, we've given you six examples in the concept note that you have. There are certainly more, um, but let me just go through two or three of them very quickly um, by way of demonstrating and illustrating. Uh, one of the really important new realities is <clears throat> the changing picture at the U.S.-Mexico border and the enforcement challenges that are facing us as a country as a result of a dramatic and profound change in the flows of people across the U.S.-Mexico border. For decades, we've had a flow primarily from Mexico of young males coming to the country seeking work. We have a whole strategy, set infrastructure, set of practices, and a culture at the border that rests on that flow, 90% of the apprehensions over the just 10 years ago were from that Mexican flow. That has now entirely shifted, both in numbers and in characteristics. The largest flows are now from Central America. They outnumber the Mexican flows for four years in a row. Um, uh, Three-fourths of that flow are from three countries, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and they are made up of families and unaccompanied or unaccompanied children. This is a much more complex flow. These are people who are seeking protection in the country. Others are coming for work purposes or because they have families in the country. Such flows represent the longer term challenge now at the U.S.-Mexico border. And that is a very different challenge from the challenge of the Mexican flow, which has characterized the U.S.-Mexico border picture since the early 1970s. They require fundamental changes in our border enforcement capabilities and our practices. A second new reality, a second new reality is that we are now at a point where the size of the unauthorized population in this country is declining. It has been increasing 
up until the period of the recession for 15, 20 years. That has now shifted. What had been a high of about 12 million in the unauthorized population in 2007 has now fallen to less than 11 million, and it's changed in composition. Less than half of the people in the unauthorized population are now Mexican. More Mexicans return to Mexico than are coming to the country illegally. Uh, and more than 60% of that unauthorized population has lived in the United States for more than 10 years. In addition, those people, that more than 60% who have lived here for such a long period of time, are the parents to 4.1 million U.S. citizen children. And so we have a picture where there's a real tipping factor taking place in how we think about and what we need to do about this sizable unauthorized population, because the lack of status becomes a, a harm that is not just a harm for individuals, it's a harm for communities, for families, for occupations, for employers, and those harms show themselves in many ways, the most recent probably being the uh, uh, ripple effects of the ice raids last week in Mississippi. A third example uh, has to do with our politics. We are in an entirely new political era where immigration is concerned as a result of its having become a top tier presidential level issue. Um, this is an administration where a long held political consensus across the top of the political parties that immigration is a net positive for the country, that consensus has broken down. It's changed. Immigration is now being portrayed as a threat, basically as a threat to our security as a country and a threat to our well-being uh, and our jobs as Americans. Uh, that portrayal of immigration has stirred up populism in this country and elsewhere. We're not the only country. This is happening in other Western liberal democracies. So that new factor puts immigration into a different realm. Immigration is now an issue that is an issue of high politics with high stakes. It's an issue that can win and lose elections. And when that is the case, it makes it all the more important to establish and to implement common sense policies that can win public confidence that governments are able actually to manage the responsibilities that they have. So it's against that kind of a backdrop and other new realities of those orders of magnitude that we have decided upon this initiative. Um, the initiative actually has already begun. We've been doing convenings. We've been writing reports and recommendations. In particularly, in particularly, in particular, we have been working on uh, asylum issues and on issues that have to do with border enforcement. But we have a good deal of other work underway in other areas. We'll be publishing and engaging in public debates as we go, as the time unfolds into the 2020 election period and into 2021, uh, whatever the outcome of the elections may be. Uh, and we are very committed to an effort that is bipartisan. We look at our history and we recognize what has to always be acknowledged. And that is the only way we have progressed in immigration policy making, whether it be administrative or legislative, has been when there has been an ability to work across the aisle. And that ability to work across the aisle is a very important tradition that we hope to re-energize. We are looking very hard for where there might be a new center around which to make progress on immigration. Um, one area in which that might be possible has to do probably with the labor market and with issues of jobs. And I'm going to turn the podium over to my colleague, Julia, to talk to you a little bit more about how we're thinking about that set of issues. Great. Thanks, Doris. And thank you all for coming today. Um, so to give you a taste of how we're grappling with just one of the issues that we'll be dealing with as part of this initiative, 
um, or thinking about how to design policies to select the right kinds of employment-based immigrants and the right level of employment-based immigration. And in our very MPI fashion, our approach is to start with the evidence. So we have papers coming out soon from some noted economists, from Harry Holzer, former chief economist of the U.S. Department of Labor, and Pia Renias from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas and her co-author Madeline Zavodny, which look at the state of the labor market and the economy and the role that immigration can play in addressing some of the challenges ahead. These papers identify a common set of challenges in our economy. The first one, of course, our workforce is aging. As baby boomers move into retirement and our fertility rates are dropping, we don't have enough U.S. workers necessarily to replace those aging workers. This population will also bring fiscal costs to Social Security and Medicare. A second challenge that's much discussed is automation. And what will this mean for jobs? Some predictions suggest this will reduce by far the number of jobs in the country. Others say, well, automation will destroy some jobs but create others and increase the pace of change in our labor markets and increase the pace of change in the skills that are demanded by employers. And both of these trends together could exacerbate mismatches that we have in our economy between the skills that willing workers have and the skills that employers are seeking, and also mismatches between where workers are and where the jobs are. And these authors argue that immigration, if managed properly, can be part of the solution to these challenges. Immigrants are younger than US-born people on average. They have high labor force participation rates, and so they can help to sustain the US workforce. And in fact, predictions suggest that, projections suggest that all future growth in the US labor market will come from immigrants and from their children. Immigrants, particularly high-skilled immigrants, are also helping with the fiscal strains that we're facing with our aging population. Immigrants can't on their own solve this problem. Immigrants age too, they retire too. Um, but we're facing right now an acute crisis coming as baby boomers move into retirement and immigration can be one part of the solution to lessen that crisis. Immigrants often complement the skills of US workers. As the US workforce is increasingly highly educated, Immigrant workers can fill all kinds of jobs in the lower skilled industries, middle skilled industries and occupations. And immigrants are also filling higher skilled jobs that Americans aren't yet trained to do because the training pathways aren't there or that American workers just simply aren't showing a lot of interest in filling. And as the pace of change in the labor market accelerates, immigration can be one tool that we can bring in in the short term and quickly the workers that already have the training and skills that are needed to fill new jobs that are emerging. Of course, immigration can't solve every issue we face in our economy. We as a country need to rethink not only our immigration policy, but also our education and training pathways. We need to make sure that our schools are preparing children for the jobs of tomorrow. We need to make sure that we open a path to higher education for those who are interested in it. And we need to make sure that struggling workers who are affected by automation or outsourcing or even immigration have the pathway to retraining and to finding new economic opportunities and new jobs. But we are the Migration Policy Institute after all, so we'll be focusing on how employment-based immigration policies can be a tool in our toolbox for working on improving our economic vitality, strengthening our economy and our workforce, and addressing the challenges that we face today. Before we develop our recommendations, we're also undertaking some analysis of where immigrants are filling jobs in our labor market today and what that might look like in the future. And we see, of course, that immigrants are filling jobs all across the skill spectrum, across a wide range of industries. And that means that we'll not be, we will not be recommending a merit-based system that only lets in the most highly skilled immigrants. We know that we need jobs across our economy. We need immigrants across our economy. We'll also be looking at projections about the future of jobs. So we know that some jobs that exist now won't exist in the future. They might be outsourced or automated. We might increasingly rely on robots to clean our homes and hotels, to mow our lawns. We might increasingly grow more of our food abroad or rely on programmers who are living outside the United States. Um, but we're surely gonna rely on a mix of US born and immigrant workers to care for our children and our elderly, to educate the next generation, to provide in-person medical care, to build and rebuild our homes and our bridges and our tunnels, and to design and repair all of those robots that might steal our jobs. Before recommending policies, we'll also be looking at the ways in which immigrant workers are moving through our immigration system today. Unfortunately, we don't have all of the data that we should on this, but we'll be looking and piecing together as best we can how people come into the country and how they transition from maybe a student visa to a temporary visa to a permanent visa. And is that through the employment-based system or actually through the family system? We'll be putting together these pieces to understand how um, immigrants are moving through our current system. 
And then drawing on all these pieces of evidence, we'll be recommending new policies for selecting employment-based immigrants. These recommendations will include a proposal for a new provisional visa, a more feasible and practical way to facilitate what already happens today when people status. Inherent in this work will also be proposals for building flexibility into our immigration system. We don't ever want to end up again in the position we're in with such outdated laws that are so misaligned with economic and demographic realities and the push and pull factors that are operating. And we'll be bringing the same approach to other topic areas that we address. We will touch on family-based immigration, humanitarian migration, and a range of other topics. Um, we'll examine the evidence. We'll talk with a range of stakeholders and, and develop our proposals. And we look forward to working with many of you in this room as we do that. We apologize, but due to a malfunction of the Doris Meissner microphone for her moderated conversation with Cecilia Munoz and Carlos Gutierrez, we are paraphrasing her questions and a moderator is summarizing them. No cuts have been made to the panelists' remarks. Doris Meissner opens with her first questions to the panelists, noting that both have been seasoned political actors on immigration and in their own political parties. And she asks, what it would take to make changes in immigration policy. She turns first to Secretary Gutierrez, asking him to reflect on whether today's immigration issues are different from when he worked on them in the Bush administration, or is it simply that the politics have shifted? I believe that the issues today are a lot greater. I think we're in a position where we're just, we've gone backwards, so it's gonna take longer to convince public servants, people, that immigration is necessary. Uh, you'll recall President Bush in his first term was, he had this great idea with President Fox of Mexico and there would be circularity and we would deposit here in the U.S. for their social security payments in Mexico. And it was just, it was a great thing. And then came 9-11. And that, that changed things. And uh, many Republicans, some Democrats, started equating immigration with national security because the 9-11 terrorists came in through the borders. And, uh, and, and that, I think, just allowed people to express their point of view uh, because there is a political swing here. Uh, but they would do it in a political correct, politically correct manner. They would talk about border security. I always thought that was code word for we don't want immigration reform. Let's get border security first. And, and who's going to decide when border security is ready? But those were the talking points. And then if you'd say pathway to citizenship, you could tell there are a lot of people in the party who would just not go that far. Uh, but it was it was quiet. It was, again, it was using code words. Today, it is you know, everything is okay. Um, and you hear the way the president talks about immigration, the way the president talks about immigrants, you give people a license to be able to talk the same way. So I think the environment today is more toxic. I think people understand immigration less. I think they really do believe that immigrants take jobs away from U.S. citizens. Um, I think they do believe that immigrants are mostly criminal. I mean, you know, it's just the, the perception has changed and it's gotten worse. And I think we're just going to have to do more work than we had to before in order to, uh, to get something done. Doris Meissner asked Secretary Gutierrez whether evidence and ideas can be influential in the debate or is immigration really just a matter of politics and emotional reactions at the present time? I think it's an issue of politics primarily because the the scientific part of it is just not recognized. We don't talk about immigration as being an economic policy. We don't talk about the fact that our economy cannot grow without immigration. Uh, we don't talk about the fact that there are job openings in this country that aren't getting filled because of a lack of immigration. Uh, you know, those are the facts. That's the science. That's what immigration uh, it, that's why immigration drives economic growth. But today it's a very emotional decision without facts. Um, so I, I think we're, we're in, the, in the worst place possible where we're debating immigration from an emotional position. And I, you know, I don't, I don't see that to be uh, conducive to an agreement. It's, uh, 
we've got a lot of work to do. We've gone backwards. The country's gone backwards. And some people have been able to say what they've always wanted to say, which is, you know, even more concerning. Doris Meissner asked Cecilia Munoz how things are different today from when she worked on immigration in the Obama White House. Well, so you, first of all, thank you for doing this and thank you for the initiative. It couldn't be more timely or more important. Um, uh, if you think about, I mean, you said it actually in your presentation 10 years ago when we were in that pretty epic economic downturn, 90% of the pressure at the border, as you noted, was still single individuals from Mexico. And uh, people on both sides of the aisle were concerned about that. You will remember, it feels like a million years ago, but it was less than 10 years ago, there was a moment of sending the National Guard to the border. That was done at the request of congressional Democrats as well. Um, so the just the dynamics of what the challenge is at the border alone, substantively, were, are, were very different. And the political dynamics were also were also different. The, you know, 10 years ago, at the beginning of the Obama administration, um, uh, Democrats as well as Republicans were in, in that sort of tricky place of being concerned about border security. And, you know, some were more interested in being in a pro-immigrant place than others. But the sort of first order of business on this and the pressure coming at President Obama from congressional Democrats as well as Republicans was, was about the border even though numbers were declining. But the, because the, of the shift that you noted in what's happening at the border, um, the, the, both the challenge of confronting adults coming with children and unaccompanied children coming from Central America has kind of changed everything about what the policy debate needs to be about. But also the... Um, the length of time that we have gone without an immigration reform and the sheer size of the undocumented population has really focused the debate now, not so much on how we get somewhere else, but rather how we enforce the laws that we have. Like the, the, the so much energy is now focused on what do we do at the border and what do we do with respect to the 11 million since, it, you know, despite numerous attempts, Congress is not engaging in a conversation that involves putting helping people get on the right side of the law, the conversation has shrunk to what, what do we do about that? What do we do about the sizable number of people who are here who are, um, that population is shrinking, but it's still visible. It's still a presence. It's still a concern. And the more time passes, the greater the proportion of folks who, as you know, have been in the country for a long period of time. They're raising children here or there. They are, you know, connected in, in the economy and communities. And that makes the enforcement conversation really hard. Um, and, and the conversation has shrunk to that conversation, making it much harder to have a conversation about what our legal immigration policy should be, what our, um, and for that matter, what, what should happen at the border. We're talking almost entirely about enforcement, which is at some level understandable, particularly given the um, sheer cruelty of what the current administration is doing. There's a lot of reason to be engaged in that conversation. I mean, we're taking people's toddlers away from them. Um, but it, that's also sucking up all the oxygen and making it harder to figure out. We, it's clearer what we should all be against. It's making it harder to figure out what we should be for. Doris Meissner asks Ms. Munoz whether she subscribes to the view that both political parties would rather have immigration as a wedge issue than engage in real problem solving. And what might change those approaches? I think there have been times when it has been true of both sides. Um, you know, I, I'm in a better position to speak for Democrats than I am for Republicans, although I'm not in, in, in politics and less in policy now than I was. Um, but there certainly have been times when the notion that the anger and the energy about where we are in immigration is a, is a way to galvanize voters. Um, but I don't think, certainly, I also think Democrats are interested in governing. Um, sometimes that gets us in, in real trouble. Um, but certainly at a time and when Democrats were, and hopefully there will be a time again, I can say that now because I've been a partisan, there will be a time again when Democrats are governing. I think there's also an understanding that, that this is a problem which, is, which we're better off getting behind us and addressing, particularly because 
there's a lot of suffering associated with this issue being unresolved. It's not just about politics. This is about humans and a heck of a lot of them. Um, not just immigrants themselves, but their families and the communities that they live in. I mean, this is a widespread problem. It is a, it is a challenge that doesn't just affect you know, particular parts of the country, it affects the whole country and gravely so. So, and I, my sense is that that is better understood. So that isn't to say that there aren't folks interested in exploiting the issue for politics. That will always be true among politicians. But I do think um, in a larger sense, there's recognition that if we have an opportunity to solve it, um, Democrats will want to do that. Mr. Secretary, what, what would, what, would you like to add to that? Well, I'll tell you, the, we tried to pass a bill, I think in 06, and I can tell I was very disappointed with many Republicans, but there were also Democrats, so I just couldn't figure out. Uh, you know, we, we wanted perfection, so if we took down family re reunification by 10 points, it would be, no, we can't support this bill because we want family reunification to be 80% of total immigration, not 70 uh, you know, just things that we couldn't get over that, frankly, were were pretty minor. Uh, and there were Democrats also who uh, introduced poison pills. Uh, we, we had it from both sides. It, it was like people did not want President Bush to reform immigration. Um, I, part of the problem, too, is we're, what do you do? And when we talk about immigration reform, we go to rightly the 11 million people. But the, the big issue with immigration reform is the future flow. And sometimes people, some members on the Hill aren't willing to talk about that. Let's not talk about future flow. That's, you know, we're not gonna bring in more. Let's talk about what we're gonna do with the problem today and how we're gonna secure the border. And the reason we have 11 million people undocumented is because our future flow system doesn't work. So. If we do anything else, we can build the wall, put the uh, put the military on the uh, on the border. Unless we have an immigration system that serves our economy, then we're either asking businesses to fold, to go to Mexico or to go to Canada, or simply just to fade away, not grow. So we're putting the private sector in a real tough position. They can't find enough workers. What do they do? They either hire someone who's undocumented or maybe they close shop. And that's the part that I just don't think we we discuss enough. It's a social issue, not an economic issue. But I will say, in fairness, that there was exactly one moment in the 30 years I've been doing this, there was one moment when 100% of the Democrats in the United States a bipartisan immigration reform, and that was 2015. Um, and the, for, you know, for better or worse, the, 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 there are political problems on both sides of the aisle, no question. But the big one, which is an obstacle to getting something done where there is bipartisan support and where we still have the majority support of the country despite everything that's happening and all the yelling, um, the big obstacle is on the Republican side because even when the votes are present to get a bill, through the House of Representatives, the, the leadership is either unable or unwilling to bring something forward because the, of the intensity of the, the folks on the negative side, right? There was the, the assumption was if John Boehner had brought up a bill or something like it in the House in 2014, that he would have been overturned by his own, by his own caucus, right? And for a long time, we've understood that the the coalition to get some anything through is overwhelmingly Democrats and a handful of Republicans. And in a Republican House, that's an impossible combination at the moment. And that's because of the intensity of the, of the negative side. That's the obstacle. Noting that during the Bush administration, Secretary Gutierrez and Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff played key roles as ambassadors to Congress for immigration reform, Doris Meisner asks Secretary Gutierrez, who can or is playing that role today? Well, my understanding is that it's been given to Jared Kushner. I, I don't see the same, you know, the same setup where you have commerce and DHS going to the Hill to negotiate on a daily basis. Uh, 
I believe there's a bill from from Kushner on in in the Senate somewhere. Um, and I believe it's very uh, slanted toward uh, skills based. That's all I know. But we had this argument as well. And, you know, there's a pendulum. Let's go 100% skill based. Well, it means you'll have some PhDs driving taxis. And, you know, skills based doesn't mean PhDs. Skills based means someone, we need truck drivers. Skills based in plumbing, nurses, medical doctors, and PhDs. So it just gets, it, it, it's a very confusing. I just want to say one thing, and I agree, Republicans have been more of a problem than Democrats. Um, but I think that there, there's a cynical joke, as you know, in town that uh, undocumented immigrants are actually uh, called future Democrats. Okay, that's that was just a... We've gotten to the position where we were close and many Republicans did not want a path to citizenship. Democrats wanted a path to citizenship. I believe we could have gotten legalization. You're not a citizen, but you're legal. You don't have to hide. That was rejected because no, they have to be citizens. So it, it, it's we we want 100 percent. I haven't seen uh, an effort where people give and take and and you give up things like if you can't get a pathway to citizenship, I think if you polled uh, the 11 million and you said, would you rather be legal or wait another 10 years? Yes, make me legal now. And I blame the Democrats for that. Uh, having said that, yes, it's more of a problem with Republicans than it is with Democrats. I wish that was any obstacle, honestly. <laughs> I don't think it was. It pretty clearly wasn't. I mean, again, we had 68 votes in the Senate for a bill which had a legalization program, albeit one that took 15 years for people to legalize. Um, look, it, it, it wasn't as if the Speaker of the House were saying to President Obama, look, if you just drop that, that piece, I'll bring it up. Um, there was that, that was not the obstacle. The obstacle was to getting anything done. Um, and that's still true. And that's a considerable... It's still a considerable challenge, and I wish I, I, I wish I could say, here's the policy problem, and we just have to figure out what the policy is, and the obstacles will fall away, but I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's a problem. I think it's a political problem, um, which is not to say that we shouldn't be doing exactly what MPI is doing, which is do, it, we've got to be able to do better than dust off the same on the next iteration of immigration reform. And we really badly need to know what we're for. We're pretty good at what we're against. And there's a lot to be against right now and with reason. But um, the situation at the border has changed completely. As you note, our law, our policy, our physical infrastructure, our training, our personnel, our, none of that is equipped for what we have right now, what we're facing right now at the border, none of it. And that has to be rethought. And I actually rely very much, as you know, on, on your work, Doris, on the work of this organization and in guiding my own thinking about what that should look like. Um, and it's also true with respect to the, to the legal immigration. God willing, we will get to that debate. Um, and God willing, we will get to it in a more thoughtful way than, you know, this, the current administration has sort of tried to put down some markers. I don't find them to be particularly thoughtful. Uh, but, but we need to start doing that thinking. And we haven't done it in really quite a long time. Legal immigration was last reformed in 1990. Um, uh, we can definitely update our policy thinking, and we, we really must. But I think we need to understand that policy alone isn't going to get us over the finish line here. Doris Meisner asks the panelists to comment on what they think it will take to move immigration reform forward, and whether it's a valid assumption that bipartisanship or the creation of a new centrist coalition must be present to advance immigration legislation. I, I, I think it would be dangerous for one party to pass immigration without it being bipartisan. Uh, it's interesting, the 2013 bill, which I, I'm not that familiar with, it was a 2000, 
uh, ten, I think. Marco Rubio was he? No, that was the that was the twenty thirteen the Gang 13. of Eight okay. bill. I, yeah. I want to talk about that. The Gang of Eight bill, right? Uh, all these bills look very, very, very similar. They do. I mean, it's almost like it's the same thing. We just do the six hundred, seven hundred pages all over again, and there'll be a few differences here, a few differences there, but you're working with the same variables. There, there really isn't a lot of change. I'll give you an example of the problem in this 2013 bill. And I remember Marco Rubio was very involved with this. Yes. Was, uh, yeah. Uh, and Senator McCain. And, and his Marco leadership. Rubio. So the, the president wanted immigration reform. You start getting Republicans to come in and say, yeah, we'll help. We'll help. Uh, but I recall that there was a, a limit on farm workers, 50,000, 60,000 in the bill. And that was a great example for me of what's wrong with our immigration policy. So Washington says we can have 60,000, call them temporary workers, farm workers, however you want to think about it. Um, I think we need 700,000 in a given year. But the law says you've got 60,000. Where do you get the other 640,000, 630,000? And that's the part that our policymakers don't get. And they don't trust the private sector to, to be the decision maker, to know what they need. Because, well, it's the private sector trying to come in with, trying to bring in cheap labor. Everything has a bullet point argument. And that's the, the problem with, with, uh, with reaching an agreement. With this question, Doris Meisner asks the panelists which immigration issues they would advise beginning with in today's labor market and security environment as a basis for building bipartisan consensus on immigration. So um, this is a hard, really hard question, and I've been thinking about it a lot. I, I think it's hard for the, it will be hard for the public to, um, I think, accept any wide ranging debate on immigration if we haven't addressed the situation that is right in front of us, particularly at the border, which is a, which is very, very difficult and very challenging. Um, and in some ways the debate has not at all caught up with the reality of, of what we're facing. Um, uh, but I, maybe this is a naive thing to say, but I think all actors in this debate, at some level, regardless of how they feel about immigrants, recognize that it's not a great thing for huge numbers of people in Central America to, and, and to come to cross all of Mexico to get to whatever it is we do or don't offer them in the way of treatment here. Um, there is a lot to be said about the way that we're mistreating people and failing to apply our own laws and our own obligations. And, but um, even allowing for that, um, we have a refugee crisis in our hemisphere, and no matter what you, you feel, we will never solve it if we try to manage it as a border situation. But um, there is, I think, a clear need for investments in the region, addressing ways for people to get to safety without undertaking this incredibly long journey. Like having people hang out in Mexico as a way of keeping them uh, out of the United States is not a good solution for a variety of reasons. Um, so this is not a short-term thing, but it is a vital thing to begin, or in some ways to, to restart, because we did begin some, much of that has been dismantled by the current administration. But addressing the reasons people are migrating is something that we are terrible at, <laughs> and historically have sort of kept in a different realm than, than the immigration debate. And we can't afford to do that anymore because what we're facing at the border is a direct result of what's happening in Central America. And we're not engaging it, either through its root causes or through creating other mechanisms for people to get to. And if the only option is to come north to our border, that's what people will do. And any one of us in this room would do it if our children were in danger, regardless of how awful the prospects were once they got here. Doris Meisner asks Ms. Munoz about the 2020 elections and what she sees happening if a Democrat wins the White House, the Senate stays Republican, and the House remains in Democratic hands. More specifically, she asks Ms. Munoz, what would winning Democrats have to deliver on 
with the likelihood that the Democratic base would have significant expectations for action on immigration. So one of my big worries about this, if I may, is that so many of those expectations are about executive action because of, of just longstanding dis distrust of the Congress and distrust of the C Congress's capacity to get anything done. And I think we have learned through hard experience that um, what you're able to do affirmatively through executive action is really limited. And uh, as we see from the current administration, what you're able to do negatively is can be quite profound, you know, given today's news on the public charge rule, for example. Um, so in that scenario, you would need some Republicans to step up and be willing to engage in a conversation about what the contours of something to address either the border or legal immigration or asylum, whatever it is. Um, you need some number of Republicans to step up, particularly if the Senate is in Republican hands. And um, I've been puzzling about this because because uh, uh, I knew we were coming today. Um, because the Republicans who were still in the Senate, who used to be among those who understood, some of them are still there, are unrecognizable. They don't understand anymore. Well, <laughs> you know, I think somebody like Senator Lindsey Graham still understands, but he's made a choice. And, and he is unrecognizable, right? So he was a regular part in, in 2006, mm -hmm. 2007, as well as 2013. I, you know, it's hard to imagine him as part of a group to figure this out any longer. So I'm not... I think I can name who the Democrats might be in the Senate who would be willing to engage in a conversation. There are Democratic members of the Gang of Eight still there, and they're still still at it. The Republican members of the Gang of Eight who are still there are, are I don't recognize them anymore, and some of them I've worked with for 20 years. So that, I mean, there are, we have a political problem on the Republican side, and it's not clear what the magic is that, uh, that, cracks the nut that gets us somewhere else. Turning to Secretary Gutierrez with the same 2020 election scenario, Democrats retaking the White House and holding the House while Republicans retain the Senate, Doris Meissner asks him what the takeaway would be for Republicans, considering that President Trump has made immigration such a central political issue. I would, uh, what I would counsel uh, Democrats is if they get the chance, don't overplay your hand. So, and and I would also tackle legal immigration, future flow. How are we going to get the labor we need first? We typically jump right into the 11 million and then the work starts getting out. They want immediate citizenship. They want who knows what. Uh, this is what they're asking for. They want to ice, they want to just to get rid of ICE, that would be the the missing opportunity if, if we just, if, if we try to get too much. Um, and that's always been the problem is, my gosh, there's no way of, of, of landing on a center where both sides aren't totally happy, but they can live with it. And I, until we get that, I just don't think we're going to get an extreme bill one way or the other. Noting the failure of immigration legislation in the House in 2013, when House Speaker John Boehner's push was thwarted by the Republicans' most conservative wing, Doris Meissner asked Cecilia Munoz whether the same dynamic could play out now, but with House Democrats. Meissner notes the tension within the Democratic Party with, on the one side, the abolish ICE wing, and on the other, the centrists. I suppose that's always possible. That's always a tension. But look, at the end of the day, I mean, to, to go way back to Erka as an example, there were groups on the left who were um, furious about employer sanctions, who um, had pretty nasty things to say about the groups who supported the compromise bill that ultimately became law. And many of those groups turned around and legalized people because there was a legalization program. And, and um, and a lot of that tension, the tension never goes away entirely, but it dissipated and it tends to dissipate in the face of what is, for, for, for any folks on the left who have constituencies, if those constituencies are gonna benefit and particularly get from the 
not legal side of the law of the ledger to the legal side of the ledger, then I think it that becomes very, very hard for purists to say no to. Some will, but it gets much harder when people's lives are on the line and they're going to benefit. And we've seen that over and over again. So, you know, I'm going, I'm, I happen to be in the middle of reading a book about um, about the Civil War and Reconstruction and Abolition. And they had the, the abolition, abolitionists had the same argument. There were folks who wanted to be pure and there were folks who wanted to be practical. And at the end of the day, when people's lives are on the line, practicality gets, uh, gets, looks pretty good. So I'm, I'm less worried about that. I, mean, I worry a lot about the debate and way it's, the way it's taking shape and about some of the positions that are uh, and some of the directions that the Democratic candidates are being pushed in. But at the end of the day, if there is um, an opportunity for progress that's real, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Getting to an opportunity is a hard part. 